So, Dr. Foriana Carbone is an accredited specialist in obstetrics and gynecology and PhD in reproductive medicine working as consultant at Ospedale Maggiore of Milan, Italy. Her clinical interest in prenatal diagnosis and prediction of adverse pregnancy outcomes such as preeclampsia are her main domain. Uh, she is a coordinator of many international trials such as ACE pre and event trial in Milan. She has published about COVID-19 in pregnancy during this year and uh, has many peer-reviewed publications in this field. So it's my honor to present you uh, for Jana Carbone with her uh, maybe the most uh, interesting, uh, not interesting, but the most uh, um, modern topic uh, for us for now in these days, COVID-19 and pregnancy. Please, Dr. Carbone. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good morning and uh, um, thank you for the kind invitation and thank you for being on the other side of the screen. Let me share my presentation. So by now we are all familiar to what we are talking about, the second generation of coronavirus related to the previous one causing SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome of COVID. Let me summarize what I'm going to talk today. I will start with a quick view on the basic knowledge of the virus. Then I will discuss about lesson learned on crisis management of the work in obstetric. And finally, I will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on pregnancy care and on the relevant aspects of the management of symptomatic patients. Coronavirus is a RNA virus covered by an envelope with these spike proteins, which give the crown shape to the virus. The main mode of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 virus is by respiratory droplets, which is not exactly the same as airborne transmission. Respiratory droplets are of bitter size and they travel a maximum of two meters about, otherwise they fall into different surfaces where people can get infected mainly by contact transmission. The virus has been also detected in feces, although the fecal oral transmission has not been demonstrated. The presence of a virus in blood is very rare, less than of 1% in some series. So it's mainly a respiratory virus and that makes less possible the possibility of a maternal fetal transmission, which has not been clearly described so to date. The incubation period is normally about four or five days. The most important aspect that makes this different virus different from other coronaviruses is that the contagious periods start two days before the symptoms start. Therefore, an apparently healthy person can already be transmitting the virus and sometimes during a long period of time, even four weeks after the beginning of symptoms. Especially those where very severe cases have a viral activity which can persist much longer than mild cases. Nevertheless, the main risk of contagion is the beginning of the symptomatic period, namely. And as I said, the infection can be asymptomatic in over 10-15% of people. And of those presenting symptoms, in the most of them, we have mild disease with upper respiratory symptoms and basically nothing else. The problem is the 20% of people that will be developed a worse disease, about 50% severe or even 5% critical illness with severe pneumonia, with acute respiratory distress syndrome, and up 50% of mortality in those requiring the intensive unit care. The global mortality is um, still unknown. We need to have stabilization of the pandemic for that. What is clear is that age is a strong risk factor and also comorbidity, especially hypertension, is important risk factor for severity of disease. The symptoms of COVID-19 are basically those of a respiratory illness, mainly fever, cough, fatigue, we can have a diarrhea also, though it's not usual, and shortness of breath can indicate pneumonia or progressive illness. X-ray is abnormal in up to 50% of cases, and this is calm, as you can see in these images, show ground glass opacity and local pattern of shadowing, often bilateral, most of them similar in different patients. 
Blood tests are also frequently abnormal, starting with lymphopenia, low platelets, and high transaminases, and progressively increasing inflammatory markers, especially LDH and ferritin, indicating real severe inflammation. High didamer can also appear and marks uh, basically hypercoagulability. Procalcitonin uh, indicates a bacterial superinfection and therefore means that the patient we will require antibiotics. Troponin can also be altered in severe cases with cardiac impairment. But one of the most important information about clinical course of COVID-19 is which is summarized in this slide. COVID-19 has an early stage in which the virus replication is the main actor. Symptoms are related to the virus activity and are mainly the ones of mild respiratory constitutional symptoms. About one week later, the virus shedding is decreasing significantly due to, due to the natural immune response of the person. In some cases, the infection can reach lung and a pulmonary phase starts with pneumonia. And from now on, and that is starting seven days after the beginning of the symptoms, the main complications are indeed related to an exaggerated inflammatory response with hyperinflammation and hyperpopulation, and that is what is has, has been called the cytokine storms, and that cause the endothelial damage, the lung damage, and all the system complication of the disease. So knowing that these phases could help us to really choose the more appropriate treatment depending on every stage. Although we have to say there is no treatment with confirmed evidence with, against COVID-19, we should be aware that in early stage we need to control the virus basically and then so we have to introduce viral agents. Um, and then um, in the when, when, when the evolved stage, anti-inflammatory and hypermodulator therapies probably may have a role. Regarding antiviral treatment, different options can be considered. They need to be started early rather than late to be able to control the virus to avoid the inflammatory stage. Hydroxychloroquine has been described to be useful in vitro and in very small study, however, uh, in combination with azithromycin, however, the data are still poor and controversial, and we have to be aware of an increased risk of arrhythmias for prolonging QT. Regarding remdesivir, is a nucleoside analog with uh, a show positive result, although clinical trials are still ongoing, but probably is a good option. And lupinavir and ritonavir are also good option, mainly in early stage, in early phase. And uh, what about immunomodulator therapies? The most important treatment are those um, inhibitor of interleukin six, which is the main inflammatory cytokine of this disease, and they are the most important treatment for severe cases. Uh, and so, tolicizumab has shown promising results. Um, some words about uh, corticosteroid, they demonstrated no benefits in SARS and MERS, although they may be useful in advanced stage for cytokine modulation. In addiction, specific treatment should be applied regarding the thrombin activation and hypercoagulability status, recommendations being made regarding the use of low molecular weight heparin in infected patients, especially the, in those hospitalized with high mort mortality has been observed. Today, waiting for better evidence, the treatment strategy in COVID-19 treatment approach is a combination of therapies that can complement each other. Antiviral drugs in early stage and immunomodulator in advanced stage may help to control the virus. Now, as you know, Northern Italy and specifically my region Lombardia and my city Milan have been the first and one of the most affected of, of the, by the pandemic in Europe. So I would like to share with you our experience in managing the pandemic from an organizational point of view. It is critical a proper organization of the hospital setting to face the COVID-19 pandemic. The three main challenges are to increase safety in the management, to size your resource, and to break the transmission chain. Overlapping these three challenges, there is a common objective, which is to protect the professionals. 
Regarding the first challenge, the best way to do it is by minimizing the clinical variability, so, so by providing guidelines so that the management of pregnancy can be uniform and you can maximize the clinical safety. Regarding staging your resource, in order to adjust the sudden increased activity and delivery diverted in your COVID hospital, an option can be to recruit staff from uh, other maternities that close down and also to recruit other health professionals in the department because the activities in other areas are expected to be dramatically reduced, such as for uh, elective gynecological activity. Uh, so you can use these professionals also. The other dimension in sizing your resource has to do with equipment. In order to cope with the increased number of deliveries, you need to increase the number of beds so you can promote an early postpartum discharge following the patient with telehealth. And the third challenge is to break the transmission chain, and this can be done through three main objectives, minimizing the exposure of the patient, detecting those suspected cases, and separating the areas. Minimizing the exposure can be done by preventing the patient to come to the hospital, which is accomplished by converting first visit to telehealth when it's possible, of course. Another strategy is to time and group visit and tests and to restrict the number of visitors to the hospital. Ideally, the patient should come alone. A way to break the transmission chain is to do a clinical triage by symptoms at first contact of to, uh, the patient to the hospital by giving a checklist that can address a clinical suspicion for COVID-19. But we know that a proportion of women attending the hospital, about 15%, uh, 15 is asymptomatic. So now with the increase, increased availability of a diagnostic test, a PCR test should be offered to all women coming to the hospital to, the get, to detect as many cases as possible before they get into the hospital. And this is probably the best way to interrupt the transmission chain. The third objective is to, um, to uh, aseptorize the facility, so um, you create contaminated areas into, to, to attend COVID suspected or COVID confirmed cases and clear areas to attend the other patient. And these affect examination room, waiting rooms, uh, delivery rooms and surgical theaters. So in some setting, like for example in Bergamo in Italy, but also in Korea, uh, they have implemented su successfully device to detect even before to get into the hospital at the walk-in or drive-in facilities. And we need to be aware that in some series it has been reported that a fraction of about 15% of infected people are professionals and 10% of them require to be hospitalized. A quarter of them need to be admitted to intensive care unit. And it is relevant that it has been described a mortality rate of about 14% in, and they were quite young. So the mortality proportion is even higher than expected for age. Therefore, the protection of health professional is essential and can be achieved by universally and massively testing of all professionals in a serial way, so every week in our hospital, every two weeks, performing a PCR test. Another strategy is to define shift so you can segment the exposure of your professional and also to provide adequate equipment and to promote its rational use. Moreover, an effective communication strategy has to be done in the hospital and it has to be timely, clear and in an alarming tone. So in the last part of my presentation, I would like to uh, address some issues regarding the obstetric management of symptomatic women because there is a big release of evidences and sometimes difficult to cope with all of them. So as I said before, we are moving towards a universal and massive screening of women coming to the hospital. Meanwhile, if it is not possible, you can try an intermediate strategy, for example, selective testing, selective admission, for instance, of those patients for elective cesarean section. But anyhow, whenever 
there is a suspicious because of any symptoms is present, of, of any symptom of this is displayed here, the patient should be diverted towards a contaminated area and should be placed in a specific examination box. There should be a confirmation of the suspicious state and then we should proceed with a clinical uh, evaluation uh, that has to be performed under adequate personal protective equipment and include the control of the mother, of the mother parameters and the fetal well-being assessment. Uh, if there is tachypnea, if there is a concern about the saturation or dyspnea, the initial evaluation should be extended with uh, performing a chest X-ray and blood work, which has to include blood count cell, liver and kidney profile and coagulation test. Take into account these parameters, you can decide if admit or not in hospital or woman. In our hospital, we are admitting any patient meeting any of these criteria here displayed. So having fever resistant to paracetamol, having a radiological criteria of pneumonia, uh, and when there is a presence of any comorbidity such as hypertension, high diabetes, uh, kidney insufficiency or immunodepression and or when there is the presence of any other signs like confusion, hypotension, tachypnea. Whenever none of these criteria is met, then home isolation is a good option given written advice on how to isolate and explaining the signs of alarm that should bring them for consultation to the hospital, providing a standardized follow-up prenatal um, follow-up by phone and scheduling all the appointments, basically four weeks after the onset of the symptoms or after two weeks with a PCR negative test. When any of these criteria of admission is present, then the, the next should be where the pregnant women should be admitted and in, unit, intensive, unit, uh, in intensive care unit according to the criteria of the American Thorac Thoracic Society or otherwise in a unit where closer monitoring can be done. And here there are the essential of the management. So, the first one is to avoid fluid overload to not add further stress to the pulmonary function. Another thing to do is to test for severity markers, already mentioned before, so ferritin, procalcitonin. In order to follow up closer the patient at high risk for adverse outcome. Another thing to do is to give adequate oxygen support to have at least 94% of saturation. And regarding the treatment, uh, I will I have already uh, addressed, but I will come back to it, to this. The treatment we are using for our moderate cases in pregnant women is to give antiretroviral for one or two weeks, also hydroxychloroquine sulfate for two days plus azithromycin for another four days. When um, if there is a suspicion of a su superimposed bacterial infection. Um, even because radiological sign or elevated procalcitonin, then we had ceftriaxone and tacoplanin to cover uh, other gram positive. Uh, and prophylactic low molecular um, weight tapering is indicated during hospitalization and at least after two weeks uh, afterwards due to the fact that the COVID-19 infection generates a state of hypercoagulability that adds to the prothrombotic state of pregnancy itself. And for patients admitted because of treat or preterm birth, both indomethacin and beta mimetics have implication on viral replication and re respiratory, fu respiratory functions. So the best option as a tocolytic is nifedipine. Uh, consider also to stop cardioaspirin after 24 weeks because not aspirin itself, but other non steroidal anti-inflammatory agents are be blamed to worsen the progression in some young individuals. Concern has been raised uh, for magnesium sulfate, which is given in case of preeclampsia and could depress pulmonary function, but if it's needed, you can use, but with caution, uh, mainly in patients with uh, unstable condition. And of course, in clinical unstable women, delivery is always a good option uh, that will improve the pulmonary function. And about that, 
the mode of delivery should be not influenced by the presence of COVID-19 because it has been shown that the vaginal secretion have no virus, so it's safe to have vaginal delivery. Everyone in the unit need to be aware that there is a COVID pregnant woman uh, in, in labor, and so above all, the anesthesiologist and neonatologist. Patient needs to dedicate staff taking care of them and uh, with appropriate, of course, appropriate protection to reduce the risk of contagion. Peridural is to prefer to avoid general anesthesia that generate aerosol and is essential not perform a cesarean section if there is not an obstetric indication. Only in case of unstable condition from a respiratory point of view, it could be an option. A continuous CTG should be recommended, such as a close monitoring of maternal condition because during the labor they could get worse. In a series from China, it has been reported a high risk of fetal compromise. Probably those cases have severe forms. There are not enough data about um, uh, the outcome in patients with moderate or asymptomatic, um, moderate form or asymptomatic. In some cases, you could consider to shorten the second stage of labor in case of problem of pushing to avoid to generate aerosol. And uh, the delayed cord clamping needs to be discussion with the mother and neonatologist. There are not enough evidence about that. And skin to skin contact, it could be done. And after four hours, uh, the uh, removal of the epidural catheter, the woman needs to start the prophylaxis with uh, low molecular weight heparin. So if the infants require an issue for prematurity or the mother has severe syndrome, so the baby has to go, has to be transferred in issue, of course, in this setting, any person COVID positive is not allowed. But if not, the risk of transmission needs to be, to, to the newborn, need to be discussed with, with the neonatologist. Because perinatal infection is possible, so active measures are needed to prevent neonatal contagion when ruminating is chosen by the family can be allowed at, because at, at the moment the risk of symptomatic or severe disease in the newborn appear low, but few randomized control studies trials uh, include new needs. So, based on what is known at this time, pregnant women are at increased risk for severe, severe illness from COVID-19 compared to no pregnant women. So it seems that pregnancy was COVID disease. So pregnant women are at higher risk of for needing a ventilator and for that than women with COVID-19 when they were not pregnant. On a large series of almost 400 uh, patients, it appears that SARS-CoV-2 in pregnant women is associated with a 0.8% rate of maternal mortality, but 11% rate of admission, admission in uh, intensive care unit. But does COVID worse the pregnancy? Uh, in that series, uh, the rate of preterm birth before 37 weeks is, uh, was about 30%. And on the 250 um, live born infants, 30% of them were admitted to an issue with 2% of neonatal deaths and an overall rate of perinatal death that was a uh, 4%. Early gestation at, uh, age at, um, early gestation at age at infection, low birth weights and maternal ventilatory support were the, were the main determinants of adverse perinatal outcomes. Only one infant born from a mother tested positive in the third trimester was found positive to SARS-CoV-2 at uh, PCR. Of course, one observation raises more questions than, 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 than answer because the infected neonate was infected in utero or it was in fact the fact that the mother was ill so she has a, uh, she may have a positive viremia and then the result of amniotic fluid was positive because of contamination we don't know we actually we don't know so evidence is um, accumulating fast uh, and this data may need to be updated soon, uh, but what we should doing is to prepare uh, in a much better way in the future. So the pandemic highlights the need for a global infrastructure to acquire data quickly and generate evidence quickly. 
I'm going to conclude uh, mentioning uh, the concern of why uh, initial distribution of COVID-19 vaccine include pregnant people. Because without explicit, the explicit data on safety in pregnant women, the Food and Drug Administration typically recommend caution in using a drug or therapy in pregnant women. And in case of COVID-19 vaccine trials, pregnant were excluded from this trial. However, the trial did show good safety profile in across multiple demographics around the world. So moreover, the type of vaccine studied in the most so far, so mRNA, mRNA vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna should be safe in pregnancy, given their biology and the mode of action. So recently, experts in maternal fetal medicine published their recommendation on December 17th uh, on, in, in the American Journal of Obstetric Maternal Fetal Medicine, in which they state that um, it would be unethical to withhold the COVID-19 vaccine from pregnant women. With, uh, so uh, on, on the fact that they routinely receive many vaccines. Therefore, maybe um, upcoming trials should include this high-risk population to investigate vaccine safety and efficacy in pregnancy also. Thank you for the attention. Professor Carbone, Dr. Miocic. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, lecture. And uh, uh, I, before to uh, go to the audience question, I have uh, one question. Um, because uh, I underwent uh, COVID-19 before uh, one month already. Um, it was uh, just interesting for me if the pregnant woman can be uh, twice or triple uh, uh, be ill from uh, this, uh, this illness, uh, this, this virus in the beginning, uh, let's say, in the, pre uh, uh, in the pregnancy and uh, at the end uh, of the pregnancy. Uh, okay, so um, reinfection uh, is not has not been described so far, even though we have to be uh, careful about the um, in the our diagnostic tool because um, they are not hundred percent reliable. It depends, um, of course, on the. Um, uh, the sample in which how it is done the, the swap, for example, and also because um, the um, uh, IG, uh, IgM is not um, are of um, low sensitivity, IgG increase their sensitivity during the, 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 the time and are uh, much more probably present in, in those patients with had a um, severe form of, of the illness. So, so far, no reinfection has been described in literature, but we, um, we need to um, more data uh, about the immunological response, even because we don't have um, our, the, the diagnostic tools which are completely uh, relevant so far. Okay thank, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Dr. Carbone, uh, it appeared that uh, uh, it's, this is the most topical issue today. We have four questions from the audience. I'll start with the first one from uh, Dr. Chaveva, and she asked, uh, uh, what is your ex experience about invasive tes testing uh, platinum Placenta synthesis and amniocentesis in women women with COVID-19. Um, yes, um, thank you for the question. This is a very good point. Uh, actually, we do perform, uh, if it's necessary, the invasive test in COVID-positive pregnant women because the presence of the virus in amniotic fluid um, has been. Um, rarely reported in, in, in very few cases, serious, uh, and so it appears that is uh, feasible. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Professor Tanya Timeva. Do you have observation uh, that uh, uh, 
COVID infection undergoes more severe in women with thrombophilia? Of course, uh, we need to consider that there is a um, uh, the, 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 the pregnancy has a, a prothrom is a prothrombotic condition itself, and of course, to this risk, you have to add the risk of the infection of SARS-CoV-2, uh, because you, as you know. Mm, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is um, receptor is uh, ACE2, so it, this is uh, actually a enzyme that which is converting angiotensin two in angiotensin. So basically, it's uh, shifting the renin angiotensin system from a vasodilator to a vasoconstrictor uh, condition. So um, we. Um, I, we don't have a, a big data about this, but actually in, in patients with um, rheumatological or immunological condition, uh, we have to be careful uh, in, in monitoring because they, they can do worst. Thank you for your answer. The next question Hi. from the audience, uh, audience is, uh, in your experience, is the probability of transmission of the virus less in the pregnant women if the pregnant women are asymptomatic but have a positive PCR test result? Um, you mean the, the vertical transmission to, to the fetus? Uh, yeah, the vertical transmission. Well, no, uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, answer um, uh, in, in, in conclusive way to this, uh, to this question because uh, vertical transmission is still a question mark. Um, what is probably um, uh, viral um, fetus varemia is um, unlikely, uh, and probably what what is uh, has been described is uh, uh, the risk of perinatal risk uh, of infection in prolonged uh, pre preterm rupture of membrane. So the hypothesis is that there is a um, com com a condition which is related to the inflammatory state, state as happened in the coronal immune system for, any, for other reasons. So the cytokine storms can affect also um, with um, production of, of interleukin and, and um, uh, the, the tissue of the, of the, the fetus. And, and particularly we have to remind that SARS-CoV-2 is a ne neurotrophic uh, virus, so can, can hit brain of the baby so we we need a very long long term um outcome uh to answer this this question we don't know if in asymptomatic patient um or the the transmission is more likely than in symptomatic patient but I but have, what i have one question Mr. professor Steref. oh thank you very much for uh, this is uh, useful uh presentation. My question is, uh, how many birds annually you have in your department? And yeah. what, is Sorry. what is percentage of C-section? And what is uh, effect impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, for percentage of uh, C-section? Uh, our hospital is the biggest uh, maternal uh, hospital in Italy, so we um, have um, almost 6,000 uh, delivery uh, per year. And uh, the, because it's a tertiary center, um, the percentage of cesarean section about 40%, 45%, because we uh, deal with many critical conditions. Um, however, the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in pregnancy, um, in our pregnant women, has not changed too much the, the management. So we are actually we are attending delivery for for this patient unless of uh, obstetrical indication for um, to performing the cesarean. Um, we had actually so far in in, in this uh, almost 
six, seven months, we have very few cases, no more than 10, in which we um, we, we were um, forced to do a cesarean section because of the critical condition of, from a resp respiratory point of view of the mother. But so far we are delivering our patient with, with, with COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Professor Carboni, there's a, a, a few more questions, but uh, 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 in continuous with the previous question uh, before Professor Sterev, uh, what do you think? Uh, are the asymptomatic pregnant women less contagious than other? We don't have a test for this. So uh, there is no a diagnostic tool that is able to um, show if you are, um, if, if the, the virus has, uh, um, is more aggressive or not in patients with symptoms or without. So actually, because there is a lack of tests uh, for this, we need to consider patients at the same risk of, um, con as, uh, at the same risk of contagion. So they can be both symptomatic and asymptomatic are risk for others uh, regarding the contagion, the possibility of contagion. Thank you. The next question from Dr. Kutukcheva. How do you manage with the discharge of uh, the COVID-19 positive mother and the COVID-19 negative newborn? Do you discharge them together or separately and give the newborn to the relatives? Uh, actually, uh, for patients who um, have been admitted, um, we consider the discharge from the hospital after um, a PCR negative test, which has, is performed after uh, at least three days of no symptoms. So the, the patient has to be asymptomatic from three days. Then we have to re we need to repeat the PCR test for three times. So one um, test, the, the, the PCR test at day one, then at day three, and then at day, at day seven. And if they are all negative, they can be discharged from the hospital. Um, and basically we are trying to discharge both mother and, 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 and the newborn, unless the newborn needs more uh, care, uh, different um, care from the neonatologist's point of view. But usually we discharge together the mother and the baby, even because one of the problem is to, um, to uh, isolate the patient at home. If it's not possible, um, uh, basically we uh, in Milan, we have um, uh, the, the the possibility to send them to a hotel. So we have done, uh, we have this, com this hotel, they are COVID hotel. They are just for, for women that cannot be isolated at home. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And the last question from the audience is, is the prophylaxis with uh, uh, LMWH different in pregnant women with COVID-19 due to their increased risk of forming blood clots that in other patients? No, it is according to the BMI, as usual. So um, there is no um, increase of doses. It, it is uh, the, the prophylaxis will be, uh, the dosage will be um, established according to the BMI of the mother. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. It was, it was a, was a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you.